If you have been following my videos regarding Joseph Smith and Hiram Smith surviving the assassination attempts at Carthage Jail, then you understand that my theory basically is that the Smiths faked their own deaths at Carthage and went into hiding, later to emerge with new identities. As far as the weight of the evidence goes, my theory of the Smiths surviving Carthage has more legal weight to it than any of the non-evidence that we've been given so far in kind of bogus histories and bogus eyewitness reports. As you recall, the Quorum of the Twelve refused to show up and testify at the murder trial of the Smith brothers at Carthage under threatening anyone who tried to serve them a writ with death because, is my theory, they were involved in, try in setting up this conspiracy to murder the Smiths. Just as the Quorum of the Twelfth and Sidney Rigdon set up Joseph Smith in Missouri for treason and execution. The Quorum of the Twelve and Sidney Rigdon were Joseph Smith's primary accusers and continue to set Joseph Smith up for execution or assassination or poisoning as most of Joseph Smith's family were poisoned in Nauvoo. It was the Quorum of the Twelve and Sidney Rigdon, and Joseph Smith identified them by name. They were Orson Hyde, Orson Pratt, Parley Pratt, John C. Bennett, and Sidney Rigdon. In fact, Joseph Smith was accusing Sidney Rigdon of setting, up, setting him up for arrest and extradition into Missouri as late as 1843 and 1844. Joseph Smith wanted Sidney Rigdon to be excommunicated, but the Quorum of the Twelve decided not to. And why? Because the Quorum of the Twelve and Sidney Rigdon, John C. Bennett, and all these other traitors were, who were part of the quote-unquote secret Council of Fifty, which Joseph Smith only knew about through uh, whistleblowers such as the young lad Mr. Eaton who was thrown out of and had to flee Nauvoo in order to save his life after he had sworn out a statement against the conspiracy of the Council of Fifty. And no, the Council of Fifty was not a Joseph Smith organization. It was an organization set up in secret to assassinate Joseph Smith and steal his church because the church was very lucrative, had lots of money and lots of support from New England while Brigham Young did set himself up with the support from the British oligarchs who he served until his death. And Brigham Young went out west and then declared war on the United States. Joseph Smith was the opposite. Joseph Smith was celebrated by such luminaries as Stephen Douglas, Abraham Lincoln, John Adams, Josiah Quincy, and many more. Joseph Smith was a political leader which was favored by the New England political establishment. And Brigham Young was a scoundrel, a pirate, a murderer, a border ruffian, and completely dissolute uh, trading in human flesh with females and children, which they uh, sold to different and various organizations and sold for, for work teams when child labor laws allowed children to be sold into slavery. But let's move on to my theory at present. And for two to three years prior to the assassination 
attempts at Carthage, the Smith brothers well knew they were targets of assassination, plots, and planning. Therefore, they were well aware of this years in advance and had years to plan their own escape through what is called a 19th century witness protection program. This had been done before when William Morgan, the anti-Mason, was targeted for death by the New York Masons. It is believed and considered by many historians that William Morgan, through the help of the Smiths, faked his own death. Now, Joseph Smith Sr. and William Morgan were friends in the Batavia, New York Masonic Lodge. They knew each other well. And William Morgan, after he escaped, arrives in Ohio, remarries his widow under assumed name, and became a Mormon. This was the template that the Smiths would have free access to use and to plan. They had done it before with William Morgan. They certainly could do it with themselves. So to have people ridicule this idea that faking one's death is so outrageous. Just remember, this has been done in every military campaign since Rome. And in fact, just recently, a Mormon fugitive was arrested in Ireland under assumed name because he had faked his own death. And he's the one, the person who faked his own death, a Mormon, fingered the prosecutor Levitt in Utah County as being crim a criminal and crook, including his wife. So this is going on today. Faking your own death is done. So who was this Louis Biderman who just happened to wander into Nauvoo in one of its most dangerous times in its history when it was being threatened to be overrun and sieged by the militia across Illinois. And who was this Spiderman who happened to just wander into Nauvoo, suddenly grasp the leadership, meet with Governor Ford twice, trying to negotiate some protection for the community of Nauvoo, which the Ford, Governor Ford said he could care less and let they th let them throw the children, let them throw the Mormon children into the Mississippi. Well, he's quite an enigma. However, he was married to Emma Smith for over 32 years. He built out the mansion house where they resided and conducted business as a hotel. He became one of most prominent citizens of Nauvoo in which every luminary and every reporter that happened to wander through Nauvoo would always end up at the Bideman's house to be enthralled by Bideman's stories that kept everybody laughing. They talk about Bideman's had constant jokes that were well remembered about red hats and the closet. I think that has a secret meaning, but that was in Biedemann's obituary. Biedemann died at the late age of, I believe, 86. Biedemann also happened to be the same age as Joseph Smith, born in, they say, 1806, Joseph Smith, 1805. Biedemann had the same personality quirks of Joseph Smith. Biedemann looked like Joseph Smith. Biedemann was fondly remembered by his children and his grandchildren as being kind, gentle, and loving, and always caring for his children. He took very good care of Emma Hale until she died 
I believe, a good 12 years before vitamin. So vitamin certainly seems to be kind of this character that shows up and saves the day and takes grasp of the leadership. So he had many of the gifts of Joseph Smith. In fact, you would say they were one soul in twin bodies. Hence, the name, Vitamin, by Damon, which is Greek for two souls. In one Joseph Smith Vitamin body. So, I'm going to go into the background of Joseph Smith as being a military agent to just give you the feeling of why this theory makes sense. Number one, if Joseph Smith was a military United States agent, he definitely would have had the protection of the United States, especially if he was going to be extracted from Nauvoo and given a new identity. I do not think it's just a coincidence that Josiah Quincy and Charles Adams shows up in Nauvoo and interviews Joseph Smith one month before his assassination. It is my belief Josiah Quincy, Charles Adams were there to give the green light to, to the operation, the military operation of extracting Joseph Smith amid a chaotic theatrical performance at Carthage Jail. So let's begin with the background. My theory is Joseph Smith's early Mormonism was a military operation acting as a religious organization. This is common. Catholic Church, religious but very political in its building its empire and putting on the armor of God and all their crusades, religion and military operations have been joined at the hip throughout history. Nothing is clearly religious without being political. Nothing is political without being in part religious. So early Mormonism was an idea of the U.S. military to create a religion to fight against the British stay behind traitors in the form of these Scottish um, ministers such as Alexander Campbell, Charles Finney, all sowing chaos on the prairie and all the other fire and brimstone type of characters that were leading or trying to vic convince many of the country people to join with the British government in fighting against the United States. Because the British government has never lost its drive, even to this day, to make the United States a, one of its another colony to restore its colonial status, bringing the British Empire into its most brilliant uh, military force possible. However, the U.S. government had fought against British infiltrators, and the most recent one was the War of 1812, in which the British invaded by sea, but also through the Great Lakes area and Canada, and the British had been arming and paying the Native Americans in the northern Ohio area to bring in guns and to act as their act as their foot soldiers in the war against the United States, which the British, I dare say, almost won because they made it all the way to Washington, D.C., burning down the Capitol. A treaty was instituted and basically the British retreated. However, they left behind many infiltrating Canadian 
immigrants, residents who were pro-British. But the major problem were the Native Americans who, before the Revolutionary War to the War of 1812, always sided with the British and fought against the Americans. The U.S. government had to, dis had to discover a method of trying to win over these Native Americans to be loyal U.S. citizens, and the best way they had determined was to Christianize them. Therefore, also, the Native Americans had been paid mercenaries for the British starting back before the Civil War in all the American Indian Wars going up through um, the War of 1812 in which the Native Americans again were the primary fighting force against the Western states during the 1812 war. Lucy Max Smith family were pro-Union and had two of their ships had been um, used by the Union in fighting the War of 1812 and her uncles were, were generals and heroes coming out of the War of 1812. So it was the plan by the U.S. government and Moore's Charity School to train up Native American ministers to preach Christianity to the Native Americans, hoping to gain their loyalty and deprive the British of their paid mercenaries. So the U.S. determined that in order to secure its borders between the oceans, Pacific and the Atlantic, they needed to pay immigrants or New Englanders to settle the western states and then pay New Englanders to expand and travel and settle all the land in between the Mississippi and California so that the borders would be secured from Atlantic Ocean to Pacific Ocean. So it is my theory that early Joseph Smith Mormonism was part of this military operation known as Manifest Destiny. In other words, it was the it was Mormonism as part of this military operation. It is that my theory that early Mormonism was part of this military operation known as Manifest Destiny. In other words, it was the religious duty of American citizens, according to Manifest De Destiny, the religious duty and a calling of God to move west and expand westward to secure the peace and stability of the continent against the British invasions. These were a series of never-ending invasions, and in fact, you can just call it one long war, hot war interspersed with cold war, hot war, cold war, hot war. They used terror, the, the British Empire used its stay behind terrorists and paid terrorists much as they do in the Middle East today, where supposedly there's stay behind terrorists of Al-Qaeda, stay behind terrorists of the Mujahideen, stay behind terrorists of ISIS. It's a template that the British have used over and over again, and no one seems to catch on. Well, hopefully with the internet, all of us will start catching on as to what a big con game this is. But anyway, therefore, Joseph Smith was designated as a... So, as I said, Smith was also designated as an Indian agent. 
This was when they settled Nauvoo. Andrew Jackson had just signed the Indian Removal Act and Joseph Smith was used as a designated Indian agent to negotiate with Chief Keokuk in paying Chief Cook, Keokuk and his tribe to relocate from Illinois over the Mississippi to Iowa. So there you have it. Joseph Smith was not only a quote-unquote religious leader prof prophesying or proclaiming that God's will is in manifest destiny, that Zion will be made in moving west, and he was also an active agent being paid by the U.S. government to negotiate with the Native Americans. Very few of the historians ever tell you exactly how Mormonism was financed because this takes a lot of money. Lucy Mack Smith states it in her autobiography, financed the first Kirtland Temple, um, financed the first Mormons that used one of their military ships to cross over from New York to Ohio. Lucy Mack says how the captain greeted her and reminded her of her famous uncle and that they were on her famous uncle's ship. So the U.S. government initially financed the Kirtland, Ohio migration. So that was the first part of Mormonism financing. We have the federal government's fingerprints all over Mormonism, Joseph Smith's Mormonism, starting from the using U.S. government ships to transport the Mormons into Ohio, to the fact that Nauvoo was almost explicitly funded by the U.S. government funds through the Homestead Act type legislation grant giving government grants of $2,500 to young couples who would move out to Nauvoo and settle in order to start settling and filling in the West to the Pacific Ocean to secure the United States borders. The United States government and Joseph Smith worked hand in hand. He became an Indian agent in the removal acts, that's Joseph Smith, and then also, have you ever wondered why Joseph Smith was able to get an audience with the President of the United States at a drop of a hat? Also, he traveled all over New England in a, um, as a celebrated prophet and uh, told about how he was settling the West. I mean, he, Joseph Smith was, Joseph Smith at the time, was a semi-celebrity.